Okay, uh, number 15. So, marketing firm obtained a random sample of 220 people in five regions of the com com uh, country to investigate a new product. Uh, the histogram shows the results for each region. The graph for which display data for level of interest with the least standard deviation. Which of these pictures has the smallest standard deviation? <clears throat> so if we look at these, smallest standard deviation means which one of these groupings is uh, like closest together. Smallest standard deviation. So A has these two really close together, but then it has these far away. So I'm going to cross out A. B, pretty far apart. C, these tails pretty far apart. E, kind of close, bunch in the middle, but the, the one that's going to be our answer is D, because D is like the tightest grouping. So smallest standard deviation uh, just means the ones that are closest together, basically. It doesn't have to mean that they're like uh, symmetric or anything like that, just uh, straight up like are they close together. All right, number 16. Uh, the transportation department for a large city wants to estimate the proportion of residents who would use a system of gondolas, that would be cool, to commute to work. The gondolas would be a part of a uh, way to reduce traffic. They took a random sample of residents and the they respond yes, no, or maybe. Which of the following is the best description of this method? That they did. So what they did is they did a sample, so it's not a census. They didn't ask everybody. And then they didn't impose, they didn't do any sort of treatment. So it's not that, and it's just a simple, simple sample survey. All right, number 17. Okay. Uh, what we have here is um, they have to do a proficiency exam and the exam consists of two sections and to investigate one section more difficult than the other they did a random sample of 50 candidates and the candidates took the exam and their scores were recorded so they took the first section and the second section so the same uh, people did both. Same people did the first and the second, and then there's their difference. Which of the following is the test statistic? So a T-score, Z-score, chi-squared, which one is appropriate to do for this two sections? All right, so I'm doing the same people did two different surveys. Mean of this, standard deviation this, mean on the second, standard deviation second. Here is the difference between them. All right, so when I'm doing a same person uh, and I've got like two samples, uh, I'm gonna do a one sample test for the difference. And since what we're doing is means, means goes with a T, and I'm gonna do it for the difference between them. And so it's one sample. So a T score would be like my value. So this is the way I would have done it. And then we'll look at the answers. Value minus, so like the null would be that the two sections are equal to each other. So it would be like zero, 10 minus zero equals standard deviation over the square root of n. So that would be like what I would be looking for. When I look at this over on my, on my answers, I've got a z-score, which is for proportions, which is not what we're doing. Chi-squared is testing how well does the observed fit expected, which is not this. And then I've got this versus this, this one versus this one. So what I did is I did 10 minus 0. That's what this is right here. The only difference between these two questions is what type of standard deviation they were using. And this one uses the standard deviation of the difference. These 
use these two right there. So I would use this if these were two different samples. But since it's the same person, it's going to be, it was A, and that's why. Because it was the same person, I'm going to do it for the difference between it. Like in the first second, there weren't two distinct samples. It was really just like the same person doing both. Like how well you do on this first mock exam versus how well you do on the second. It would not be two different samples of people. It would be the same sample of people in two different things. Okay, number 18, new employees at a large corporation are going through a training during their first week of employment. The new employees take a written assessment to determine how well prepared they are for their jobs. A score greater than the mean indicates a well prepared employee. Assume the following distributions of new employee scores have the same mean score, the maximum, and the minimum. Which distribution? as a shape that is most likely to represent the greatest percentage of well-prepared employees. Okay, so a score greater than the mean indicates a well-prepared employee. Which one has the greatest percent? This would be well-prepared over here. Which one has the most people over here and a small amount over here? This would be skew left. Distribution skewed left. All right, number 19, probability. Um, <clears throat> so based on the past record, Luke, an archer from the archery team, has a probability of hitting an inner circle at 90% of the time. Assume that one practice, Luke will attempt five shots, and this is like his probabilities that came out. So this was his probabilities in five. So he hit all five, 59%. Which of the following, or what's the probability that the number of times Luke will hit the inner ring target out of five attempts is less than the mean of X? So I need to get the mean of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this into my calculator and I'm going to get the mean. All right. Okay, so I'm going to make a list. I'm going to name that list like, I don't know, A and B. So I'm going to put on here that 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And on the other list, I'm going to put those probabilities. So 0. 0.1234, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so I made that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform a calculation on it. So I'm going to do menu, statistics, calculation, and it's for one variable. And so I have my list is the 0 through 5. And then I do, on this, have a frequency. My frequencies were the B category. So typically I leave the frequencies alone but I do have a frequency list, so that's like my B, and I'm gonna click OK. So when I do that, I got a sample mean of 4.5. So I got the mean of this list, geez, X bar equals 4.5. So what we're asking is, What's the probability that you get less than the mean? So probability of getting, there's 4.5 or less 
what are all of those probabilities added up together? And it is A, like 40%. Okay. So on this one, uh, it was the, the thing was getting the mean from this type of list, and it has to deal with doing with doing it in the calculator. So doing a stat list and then doing a, a one variable calculation. All right, number 20. Number 20. Uh, so what we have is a medical center conducted a study and they did a random sample of 16 people who had a heart disease and they had a mean of the, the people in the sample, they had an, uh, an X bar of 264.7 milligrams with a sample standard deviation 42.12. Assuming all condi conditions are met, what is the following 90% confidence interval for the mean uh, for this? Okay, so how do I do a confidence interval? So confidence intervals are, just let me pull up my uh, formula sheet. It doesn't really go in depth on the formula sheet, but it does enough. So on the formula sheet, confidence interval is your statistic plus or minus critical value times standard error. So on this, uh, this is my statistic. And then I'm going to plus and minus the critical value times standard error. So standard error, uh, OK, so I'm doing means. So it's for a mean cholesterol level. So I've got X bar, and it was one population. So standard error equals S over square root N. S over square root N. So that is my standard error. And then my since I'm doing means, like a mean cholesterol level, the I do uh, T is my test statistic times standard error. So standard error, it says, is stand, sample standard deviation over the square root of N. So N was 14. To get your T value, so T is I'm doing a 90% confidence level. And when we go to our table, I need to know my degrees of freedom which is 16 minus 1, so it's 15. So when I'm looking at this, I'm going to go to my table. I'm going to go to the T. So T, 90% uh, confidence at a degrees of freedom of 15 is 1.753. So 90% confidence. 15 degrees of freedom, 1.753. So T equals 1.753. So when you do this, multiply together, you get so 264.7 plus and minus 18.491. And so when you do plus or minus that, I got this range. That would be my range. So doing a basic confidence interval. So the fact that we are doing means told me to do a T, and then I got the T, T value or whatever. There. All right, number 21. Um, okay, so what we did is this is like a simulation that they did a thousand trials of, and it says based on the results, is there convincing statistical evidence that at a significance level of 5% that of the event, at least seven out of 30 tickets is unlikely to occur by chance alone. So at least seven 
out of 30. So all of these to infinity. Did, could that happen by chance alone? What's the percent chance of that actually happening? So we're testing it at an alpha of 5%, and we want to get what was the percent chance of that happening, and is it greater than or less than? So here's the times it happened out of 1,000. So 78 plus 39 plus 15 plus 5 plus 1 is 138 out of a thousand so that's something like 0.138 greater than five percent so what that means is i have no i would conclude i have no evidence so based on the result is there evidence no 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 uh, no, because the simulation selects that it's likely that Audrey could sell anywhere from 0 to 11. Eh. No, because the simulation suggests would occur about 13.8% of the time. That's why. This number happens so much, it's way bigger than our cutoff of like 5%. All this is saying is that I could get 11, so it means it could happen. It's like, no, there's a very small chance of getting 11. So E is our answer. 13% is a very high chance of happening. It could happen 13.8% of the time, which is very high compared to our alpha of 5%. Okay, number 22. Uh, I've got a university doing a survey. They've got 34,000 students at the university. They did a random sample of 370 males, 400 uh, females. Of the 770 students selected, 493 indicated this. What are the population and sample? Hopefully this one's not too hard. Population and sample. Population is who did we choose from? So from would be 34,000 students, so not those. Uh, and then our sample is who did we actually ask from, which was these 770 people. So, uh, and the sample is whether each student is male or female. No, the sample is who we asked. Who, uh, who is this, the 770 people who were selected? Uh, this one is the 493, like this right there is like your P hat, 493 over 770. But the sample is who, and it was all those people, so not he, it was D. All right, number 23. Okay, so these come into like names. We, I didn't want to go into the names too much this year, and I'll show you why I think you can do it without the names. I didn't worry too much about it. Okay, a study will be conducted to see if new medicine reduces blood pressure. As part of the study, I did a, a, a random sample of 40 men, and, and I will take, they will take the new medicine every day for a month. At the end of the month, their blood pressure will be measured again. Of the following, which is the best procedure to investigate a statistical analysis? Okay, so what we're doing is I'm doing a sample and I'm getting, what am I getting is I'm getting their blood pressure level. So blood pressure, is that a mean or is it a proportion? Pro proportion. So is it a percent or a number? Well, uh, blood pressure in this case, um, it's not like a percentage level. It's, it's given like a number. Like you have a blood pressure of, I don't know, is it like 100 a decent number? I don't know. So, but it's normally a number. So this is a mean. So means are T's, proportions are Z's. So I can immediately cross out these. Those are gone. Um, okay, is chi-squared means is our observed fitting expected? 
And is, is it a bunch of different stuff? All I did is, is the blood pressure getting better? So we're not saying expectance or anything. Okay, so we're doing a two sample t-test or a matched pairs. And so then the simple question is, did we do two samples? Like, did I do two samples? And I did a random sample. So I did not do two samples, it would be D. So that's the easiest way, I think, to go through those problems, is just cross off, is it a Z or a T? And then go through one sample or two sample and um, go from there. So that's number 23. All right, number 24. Okay, this one is uh, pretty complicated. Uh, and we haven't gone in too much into little outputs like this, uh, but let's look at it. So what we have is I have a roadrunner that tends to run instead of fly. While running, the roadrunner uses its tail as balance. Here's the total length in centimeters and tail length were recorded. Uh, and what we did is we did a least squares regression to predict the tail total length. Okay, so when you're given something like this, you'll always have something that's got, it says constant, and then this one is your x value, total length, because that's part of the question, is total length. So this part will always be part of like the question. So then what you're gonna focus on is this column right here. And what it is, is this is giving you the equation. So it gives you the equation constant, so negative 1.281, and then it gives you the the x number, so 0.5264x, and then that's just plus. So that's actually my equation. y hat equals constant plus this x. So 0.25264x. Okay, suppose the roadrunner has a total length of 59 centimeters and a tail length of 31.1 centimeters. Based on the residual, did we over or underestimate? So residual, a residual is like, where's my actual? This is my actual. And where's my predicted? So I want to get a prediction if this was 59. So I'm going to like plug in 59 to x right there. So I'm, I did negative 1.281 plus 0.524 times 59. And what I got was a predicted value of 29.7. We'll just go 7, 8. That's like my predicted. So like here's my least squares regression. My prediction was 29.78. My actual value was 31.1. So is our re, uh, residual, does the regression model under or over so are we under or over estimating? So in this case, we are under estimating. So I'm not over, I'm under. And is the residual positive or negative? The residual is positive. So it would be A. So that one, um, like the whole residual thing, but then it has this uh, equation format. So the equation is using this predicts, it gives me this prediction equation where it's always like, they'll, there will always be constant, which is just by itself. And then there's always something that's part of the problem that goes with like the X. Um, but okay, but remember when we're doing a residual, I have my predicted, I have my actual, and so when I draw it, I can clearly see this is a positive residual, like a positive difference. 
Alright, number 25. Okay, the distributions uh, is approximately normal with the mean of 4.6, standard deviation 0 0.6. What is the closest percent between 4 and 5 minutes? Alright. Mean 4.6, standard deviation 0 0.6. How much is in between four and five? All right, so what is that number? All right, so a normal distribution, whenever you're seeing normal, you should be thinking about like Z, standardized scores. So what I'm gonna do to get the percent is I'm gonna do a Z score for the number four and I'm gonna get a z-score for the number five, and I'm gonna see what percentages they are. So I'm gonna do the z-score for four. So four minus the average divided by standard deviation. So you get a z-score of negative one. So if I look on my table, negative one z-score, uh, a negative 1.00, Z score, so negative 1.00 is 0.1587. 1, and that's the value less than. So 0.1587 is this right there. Alright, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this one. 5 minus 4.6 over 0 0.6, which is 0 0.6 repeating, so 6, 7, because our table goes to two decimals, so I'm going to go to positive 0 0.6 and then scroll over to the 7, 6, 7, so that would be 0.7486. That is this value all the way 7486. So if I'm trying to get this red area, I need to subtract those two. And when you do 0.74 minus 0.15, you're getting about 59%. So that was uh, beginning of the year z-score calculations and getting, getting a uh, middle value between them. So getting those two z-scores. All right, number 26. Uh, okay, a company produces millions of one-pound packages of bacon every week. They want no more than 3% of the one pound packages to be underweight. The investigation compliance, uh, okay, so I want no more than 3%. I have a random sample of 1,000 packages and found 4% to be underweight. Assume that all conditions where inference were met. Do the, does the data provide convincing evidence at a 5% significance level that more than 3% were underweight. So what I have is I'm testing this claim that I don't want more than 3%. Um, but I did this sample, so I did this sample of 1,000 and got a sample p hat of 4%. So I got this sample of 4% from 1,000. So does this show me evidence that this must be wrong? So was this 4% likely enough or unlikely enough to happen by chance? So I need to figure out this percent chance of happening. So what, I'm, what we're actually doing is we're carrying out a significance test for these P and P hats. Like this would be HO is P equals 3%, HA is P greater than 3%. So that's 
So I'm doing, since it's a proportions, it's a Z, 4 minus 30% over uh, standard deviation is standard deviation for proportions is P, 1 minus P over N and square root. over the square root of p. So we're saying that this is my p hat, this is my p, 1 minus p over square root of n, or n, 1,000. So when you get that, that means that this had a z-score of 1.85. And so then I can get, like, what's the percentage? What percent chance was that to happen? Z equals 1.85. And so since we're doing, we're doing a greater than test, what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to look up the negative value because this table only looks up the less than. So if I come over here and look up positive 1.85, I would have to do 1 minus this value. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come over here and look up negative 1.85, and then I don't have to subtract it. So 0 0.0322. 2. So when you get that value, 0 0.0322, that's this percent chance of happening if this truly were the mean. So that is less than the alpha, so I do have evidence. I do have evidence. So do we have evidence? Yes, I do. So I'm going to cross out the nose. And then there's my p-value less than the significance level. So b. All right, 27. Here is a histogram of sampling distributions. Sample size, 1,500, and the different graphs for them. So which of the following is the correct in least value of n to greatest value of n? Okay, so all that I see is there's a difference. This has the smallest standard deviation. This has the biggest standard deviation. So how does that do with sample size? So remember, if your sample size is big, your standard deviation is small. So this is my smallest standard deviation, which means this is the biggest sample size. And then this is the biggest standard deviation, which, which, which means this is the smallest n. I believe it goes A, C, B. So the bigger your sample size, the smaller the standard deviation. All right, number 28. Uh, I'm going to do a study to investigate the effects of soft drink on fat stored. I did a sample of 80, uh, 80 adult volunteers, 40 are randomly assigned to a soft drink a day, and 40 are asked to drink water each day and not do soft drinks. At the end of the six months, they're recorded, the people in the group had on average a higher per percentage than those who drank water. What is the most appropriate um, assumption, conclusion. All right, so there's evidence, there's evidence. Uh, cause and effect cannot be established. So um, what I'm seeing initially here is when it's saying cause and effect cannot be established, that, was, that would be as if I did an observation, like a survey, 
But in this instance, I was assigning them to do something. So I'm doing an experiment. So if I'm doing an experiment, I can do cause and effect. So that I know those are wrong. All right, so let's look at the difference between these things. So there's evidence, consuming soft drink causes more fat, um, and the conclusion can be generalized to all adults. The conclusion can be generalized to all people who drink soft drinks. The conclusion can be generalized to adults similar in the study. So that's the difference on A, B, C, is who can we actually generalize this to? So can we say all adults, all people who drink soft drinks, or adults similar to those in the study? So I can do adults if it was truly a random, uh, a random uh, sample from our population. Uh, in this case, this would be if it was a sample of soft drink people. And this is just what we're going to do. So what I did is it says we did our sample of 80 adult volunteers. It doesn't say if they drink soft drinks a lot or before. So B is not like my answer. It doesn't say 80 adults who first already tell me they drink a lot of soda or not. Um, okay, so the question is, did we do a random from the population or not? And so since there's this word here, volunteer, volunteer might not might not represent our population. If they're volunteering, they might be um, healthier or not healthier or something. Like, we, we don't know that. And so it wasn't from our population. And so A is not. All we can do is generalize similar to the people. Similar to, so they need to be similar to our volunteers. So that was up, that's what was up with that problem, is who can we generalize it to? Okay, 29. Uh, I did a random sample of 1,018 residents and how supportive they are based on the responsive. Can you make a 95% confidence interval on very supportive or somewhat supportive people? So these people right here. So I counted those up as 723 people. And so I want to make a 95% confidence interval. So what this is, so what this is, is this is my P hat of 723 out of 1,018, which I calculated was 71%. So that's like my, that's like my, statistic to start off plus or minus so like I don't even know I don't, not those not those uh, okay so now I've got C D or E and so 95% confidence interval and I'm doing proportions so I'm doing a Z times standard error so 95% confident so maybe let me look at the standard error first so standard error for a one p hat is p hat one minus p hat over n. So I've got p hat one minus p hat over n. And then how do I get my z? So getting your z is I want a middle 95%. So the question is, what is this z-score right here on the table? And so on the table, if you remember, that would be um, 95 means that there's 2.5%. So that means I'm actually looking up the value 97.5% for like my z-score for 95%. So like on my table, my z-score 
I'm, these are the percent values here in the middle. So I'm looking for the closest thing to 0 0.9750, which is right there at 1.96. So 1.96 is the value 0 0.9750. So 1.96 is the Z score for a 95% Z confidence interval. So you get something like 0 0.71 plus or minus 0 0.028. So it's E. All right, number 30. <coughs> uh, the manufacturer claims that the average number uh, is 400. And the average number of cycles for its batteries are 400. The consumer does a random sample of 100 and calculate the mean number. Which of the following is justified by the central limit theorem? So central limit theorem says that if your sample size is greater than or equal to 30, that the sample distribution will be normal. All right, so let's see which one of these is actually looking at this. So uh, the distribution of the number of sample is approximately normal because the population mean is 400, is greater than 30. So we're doing sample size greater than 30. So sample size greater than 30, sample, 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 population, no. Okay, so I got B, C, D. The distribution for the sample is approximately normal. For the sample is approximately normal. The distribution for the population is approximately normal. The distribution uh, of, the num of the sample means is approximately normal. Okay, so what's the difference between these? So uh, our theorem says that the sample distribution, the sample distribution of your X bars, like all the different X bars that I get on my 100 samples, those sample means will be normal. Not the population and not this not every single sample, it's the means of all the different samples are normal. So not B. D. All right, number 31. Uh, news organization conducted a survey. They did a random sample of 1605, and they found that 16.2% of adults uh, preferred a simple uh, method. They wanted a margin of error of 90% confidence interval. Uh, and what's our, what's our answer look like? So um, I did, they did, they got a P hat of 0.162. That's what that is. And we want, we're doing a 90% confidence interval. So um, what I have is we just did they're, they're looking for uh, the margin of error, which is your statistic times standard error. So I specifically used z-score because I'm doing percentages. Percentages go with z-score. So we just did the standard error is p1 minus p over n. That's what the formula says. So, not this, not this. Um, yeah, okay, so it comes down to getting the correct z-score. And so I'm doing a 90% confidence interval, so the middle 90%. And so what is this z-score? So on the table, 90, 5, and 5. So I'm looking for 0 0.9500. What's the, cl the closest z score to 0 0.9500? So 
five. Uh, I've got one point six four, one point six five, one point six four, one point six five. So what they did, they just went right in between. So not that, not that. Okay. Thirty-two. Okay, thirty-two is really hard, actually. Um, all right. So what I have is I have uh, I'm wanting to reduce body fat, and so these are ten people before and after. So it's the same person, same person in both. And what I have is I have their body fat um, percentages. And so what we're doing is they want to investigate, uh, can it help, here's the key here, predict, predict body fat um, from one to another. What's the most appropriate statistic? So I'm doing percentages here. So percentages, what I think of is, I think of like a z-score. So like I know it's not t. So I know it's not A and B. And then chi-squared is like, is it meeting our expected? So is there an expected value? And there's not. So we're either doing a two sample Z test or a linear regression. Um, and so honestly speaking, I probably would have chosen this one because of the Z score and everything. But because it says predict, our prediction equation is always a linear regression. I'm trying to predict, uh, I'm trying to get like a prediction line to be able to say, if you're at this weight, I expect you here. If you're at this weight, I expect you to be here or whatever, a prediction. So since it was saying predict. So that was a really tough one. I probably would have chosen that one myself, but it was actually E because it's a prediction equation. Okay, number 33. <clears throat> a recent survey estimated that 19% of all people living in a certain region use sunscreen. The margin of error was one percentage point. Based on the estimate on, and margin of error, what's the most appropriate conclusion? Approximately 1%. Okay, so this goes into this margin of error of 1%. So what does that mean? So margin of error is like, here's my p hat of 19%. And margin of error means like on a confidence interval, I would go 1% either way. And this would be my confidence interval. Um, and so... 1% of people were surveyed. That's not what margin of error is. Between 18 and 20% of all people in the region were surveyed. No. We're talking about percent of people using sunscreen. Uh, all possible samples will result in 18 to 20% being uh, using. Uh, so all possible samples of the same size will result in this. Okay, let me hold on to that. Let me just look. The probability is 0.01 that a person will use sunscreen. So no, that's not what that is. We're saying this is, this is where we think the probability that they're going to use sunscreen. Uh, it is plausible that the percent of all people in the region using sunscreen is 18.5%. All right, so what's the difference between C and E? Uh, the difference here is this one says all possible samples will result in 18 to 20%. And this one says it's plausible to be 18.5%. So in this case, this estimate says, hey, it is plausible. This here means that this is the only sample. That's not how confidence intervals work. Remember, a confidence interval is like, I get one that says 18 to 20%, and maybe I get another that says 18 and a half to 20 and a half. I get another one that says like 19 to 
21. I get another one that says 17 and a half to 19 and a half. And then there's like a mean somewhere between there. So not all samples are gonna be like this. So that's not right. It would be, it's plausible is what that is saying. Okay. Number 34. Uh, okay, according to a recent report, the customers who shop spend on average 1500 uh, at the store. To investigate, they did a mean and standard deviation of a random sample of 120 customers with all the conditions met the hypothesis test obtained a p-value of 0.25. Which of the following is a appropriate conclusion? Okay, so 0.25 compared to your typical alpha of 5% is much bigger than. That's a pretty high percent chance of happen. So when that happens, I would say that there's no evidence for whatever I'm testing. So, is evidence, is evidence, is evidence. Those are gone. Right. There is not convincing evidence uh, that the mean amount spent by each, each, spent each year by all customers is greater than 1,500. There's not convincing evidence that the mean amount of money spent each year by any sample of 120 customers is greater than 1,500. Okay. So, uh, the difference here is at the end. The mean spent each year by all customers who shop, and the mean spent each year by any sample of 120. So what we did is, this is basically saying, I can say all customers if I did a random sample. And so it says that, uh, they did a random sample of 120 customers who shop at the store. So that means I can say this for anyone who shops at the store, all customers who shop at the store, because it was a random sample. So E is not right. All right, number 35. Scientists working for a water district measure water at the level each day, daily water, varies um, and has a distribution approximately normal with a mean of 84.07. The probability that the daily water will be at least 100 is 0 0.064. What is the closest probability to get 90. Like what 90? What do I think the closest probability is for the green? Uh, and there's a bunch of really close numbers. So I don't think it's 50%. 50% would be exactly at 84. So the green is going to be, you know, I don't know. It's going to be, I can't just guess between those. I know it's not 50 though. Okay, so what I have to do, this is kind of tough, uh, is I need to get um, the, so what I can do here is I have a probability and I have a number and a number. So like I know when I do 100 minus 84.07 over the standard deviation, it gives me a a z-score that gives me this value up here of 0.064. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up 0.064 and give me that z-score to get what that value is. So I'm going to look up 0 .06, um, 0.064. So that's about 1.52, I'll say. Yeah, 
1.52. So, uh, 1.52. And so, what I want to do is I want to do this one right here, where I do 90 minus 84.07 over standard deviation. So I need to know what this standard deviation is. So I multiply it, divide this. So the standard deviation ends up coming out to like uh, about 10 something. And so now when I plug that in for this value, Uh, you get a z-score of about 0 0.057 uh, which 0 0.5 So our point, sorry, point five, seven. So point five, seven. So point five, seven, point two eight four three. So zero point five seven. You get about point two eight four three, which is at that twenty nine. So that one was like, it gave you a percentage so that you could get the Z so that then you could get the standard deviation to do this other problem and then you do it. So it had a bunch of different like solving for um, a missing standard deviation and plugging it into a different problem. So that was, a, that was definitely a more uh, involved problem. Okay, 36. The president of a large company uh, recommends that employees on average do 24 hours of community service. The president believes it was different than 24. Uh, so what he does is he does a random sample and uses a 95% confidence interval to get this value right here. If all conditions for inference were met, does the, uh, does the interval provide conv convincing statistical uh, evidence? So does this provide evidence at a 5% level and I did a 95% test and this value doesn't have 24 as plausible? So, uh, does do we ha does it seem like we have convincing evidence? I would say yes. And the interval supports the belief because zero is contained in the interval because twenty four is not in the interval. So yes. So reading all you had to do on that one was be able to read a confidence interval and understand that 24, we're saying that 24 is not plausible. We think that 24 is not a reasonable uh, answer. It doesn't mean it's not possible. We're saying it's not plausible. We don't believe that it's true. Okay, 37. Uh, what we did is we estimated 36% from uh, country X were first married between 18 and 32 and 26% of country Y were first married between those two. Based on the estimates, I did a random sample of 60 from country X and I did a random sample of 50 from country Y. Um, and we did country X minus country Y do we think that that interval is greater than 15%? So, uh, 
So what we're testing for here is I'm doing country X minus Y, which I have these percentages of 36% minus 26%. So I'm getting this initial finding of a 10% difference between the two. And what we're saying is, uh, it's saying find the, uh, what's the probability that it's greater than 15%. So like if I had 10%, what's the probability I got 15% or more? What's the percent chance of that happening? So it would be 15% minus 10% over the standard deviation for two samples. So I go to my chart and I've got two samples of p hats and this is my formula. P1 minus P N1 plus P2 1 minus over N2. So that is my formula. So I'm going to put that in. I'm going to do P1 minus P over sample size of 60 plus, oh wait, that's, it was not 15%. It was 36 and 26. So 36%. 1 minus 36% over 60 plus 26%, 1 minus 26% over 50. So when I did that, I got a Z score, and you can check me of 0 0.57 and so when you look up 0 0.57 on the table so you could look up positive 0.57 and it's 0.7157 and you do 1 minus it or you can just look up negative 0.57 and then that's already the 1 minus part so 0 0.2843. So 0 0.2843. All right, three more, and then good. I know I've haven't gone super in detail, just enough to where we've gone over them all, um, and I can help you out individually on these a little bit more. Okay, so this is one of those ones with the output, computer output again. So what we did is we did a sample of 11 store receipts and the cost it took per each receipt. Okay, so here's this whole like table output again. When you look at these, you look at this column and I told you to look out for it to say constant. This one's weird, it says intercept. These are the same thing, constant and intercept, y-intercept. And then this is your x. So, like that's my numbers there. Okay, so it says assume inference or met. Which of the following is a 95% confidence interval? for an increased item of one purchase. So if I increased, if I actually purchased not one item, but 12 items. Uh, okay, so what am I looking for? So um, what I've got is this is my X. This value is what I care about, that 2.784. So that, is my X bar, that 2.7 number. Okay, where do these other numbers come into play? So let's look them up. Uh, on a table, these are like your T values. So I need to look up the T for a sample size of 12. So that means degrees of freedom equals 11 at a 95% confidence rate. So degrees of freedom on the T table 
degrees of freedom of 11 at a 95 percent uh, so good degrees of freedom are yeah 95 percent so the two point two six oh wait, there we go I got that I got that mixed up so if I did one less it'd actually be a sample size of ten it would be nine and so the degrees of freedom of 9 at a 95% is that 2.262. So that's where they're getting this 2.262, so that's not right. And then you can see it says standard error. And so this is my standard error for the X bar. And so it's supposed to do your test statistic times standard error. And so this is already my standard error. So that's my answer. This is a really tough question with all the outputs and stuff. And so I don't have to do the square root of n because that would be state population standard deviation over the square root of n. But that's what standard error already is. So that was like a really tough, uh, tough question there. Bunch of different stuff going on. Okay, I've got a few minutes left until I need to stop. Uh, so 30, 39, um, do, 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 a doctor, new diagnosis. So I've got this hypothesis test. The patient does not have the disease. The patient does have, does have the disease. And what I'm doing is the doctor is going to prescribe medication if he believes the patient has the disease. Which of the following is the power? So remember, power is I... I think the alternative is true and the alternative is true. So like I did the thing and it was right. So if I think the person has the disease, if the doctor believes the person has the disease, he's going to prescribe. So that's what it is. It's going to be the probability uh, indicates they have the disease and they do have the disease. That would be the power. I think the alternative and they do. I think they have the disease and they actually do. The test says that they have the disease. All right. Uh, and number 40 um, is a chi-squared problem. So to investigate the relationship between age and preference, they did a survey. The survey asked which candidate, so do you like candidate one or do you like candidate two, and what age group are you in? Are you in age group one, age group two, or age group three? All right, and what they did is they did a hypothesis test and they got three point, the test statistic is 3.7408. Approximately what is the probability that the observed responses would be farther than the expected if there was no association? So observed, expected should be screaming that your test statistic is chi-squared. So chi-squared. And so I'm actually doing a chi-squared test where this is my value. So I need to look up in the chi-squared table what this percent chance of happening is. So when I go to the table, the very last table is this chi-squared. Um, probability has to deal with degrees of freedom, and then I can get my probability. So degrees of freedom is uh, column minus one. So scratch out a column, row minus one. So that would be column, row minus one times column minus one would be one times two degrees of freedom equals two, one, two. 
So degrees of freedom equals 2. So the degrees of freedom of 2, and I'm looking for 3.74. Uh, so that's super close to 0.15, a little bit bigger than 0.15. So what's a little bit bigger than 0.15? It would be B. So that was another kind of tough one. Expected, observed. Expected, observed. That's the chi squared all over it. All right, so these are pretty tough questions. There's a lot of tricky parts in them. There's multiple parts to them. There's not just like, here it is, and can you tell me this? So um, going through all these videos and uh, looking back at those AP classrooms is going to be super important uh, to try and get these down. We're going to do some more examples and we're going to do another test and uh, keep on trying to get these different parts down.